Okay, so welcome everyone. I'm really happy to be here uh, today with you. As Mary said, I'm Senior Research Director for Slash Data, and we'll be discussing the evolution of the developer community out there and how it has grown and how diverse it is, and therefore how you can segment it to target it more effectively. But before I do that, please allow me to very, very quickly introduce Slash Data to you so that you, if nothing else, understand where the data comes from that I'm about to show you. So um, we help the world understand developers. We survey more than 30K developers annually across multiple sectors. I'll show you in a minute. Uh, and based on this research, we um, show people where developers, who developers are, so the size of the community, the segments, um, the tooling decisions that they make, so the technologies they're adopting, and where they're going next, so emerging platforms and emerging trends. Um, some of the big guys in the industry are our clients and um, many others as well, just a few names here. Um, oops, sorry. Um, okay, so what we do, as I said, uh, we survey 30K plus developers annually. We do that through two survey waves annually. We have around 18 to date, and actually there's a 19th running as we speak. So if you are a developer, please buy, uh, pass by our booth and I'll tell you how to join uh, the crowd in answering the questions. Um, we reach developers from 10 development areas, um, shown on the left here, so mobile, desktop, web, and so on. Um, mind you, these are not distinct uh, audiences, not distinct groups. I'll show you how they overlap in a minute. Um, and we reach developers through more than 87 uh, partners and channels each time, and they're not the same 87 every single time. And they range from really, really small local meetups to really large vendor uh, communities. So, in that way, we're pretty confident we have a representative sample of the dev community. All right, and with that out of the way, this is what we'll be talking about in this session. So I'll show you the growth of the global developer population. We'll discuss uh, the key drivers behind that boom. Uh, we'll see if developers have any power as decision makers. And then we'll start discussing how diverse the developer ecosystem is by uh, focusing here on the profile of mature and emerging development sectors and seeing how they're different. Um, and then how exactly you're supposed to reach this diverse uh, developer um, say, um, ecosystem more effectively. So to segment or not to segment, that is the question. So let's dive in. Um, okay, so this is based on our survey data, but also um, um, other resources that we use. I'm very happy to discuss methodology with anyone who is interested in our booth. I'll be there for another hour after uh, this talk. Um, but uh, based on our data and all those resources, we find that uh, the developer ecosystem currently has um, a, a bit north than 20 million developers, 20.4 estimated. And that is 30% up as compared to two years ago. So compared to the end of 2017, we had 15.7 uh, back then. We now have, not now, but end of 2019, we had 20.4 million. Um, and even if we employ a rather conservative model, uh, we find that the developer population will in fact exceed 22 million by the end of 2020. So we expect to be somewhere between 22 and 23 million by the end of 2020. Okay, so what are those 20.4 million sorry, doing? Uh, where are they involved in those 10 sectors that we are researching? Um, so first thing to note here is that uh, all these numbers, of course, uh, don't add up. If you try to add them up, they add up to far more than 20.4, and that's the overlap I talked about. So um, on average, each developer is involved in 2.6 of these sectors. In fact, 67% are involved in at least two software sectors and 22% uh, in more than four. Um, and that's not very odd, is it? Because you may have a backend in the cloud and you can have a front end the web and the mobile to have both types of experiences and an ML API to go with that. So that's set four sectors uh, just like that. Um, the second thing to note here is the growth rates uh, of these sectors. So web is the biggest uh, and it's growing. Remember we said it was 30% uh, increase um, in two years, so 2019 to 2017, but that was not 
uniform across all these sectors. So we have machine learning, AI, data science, that was this, the sector, the one sector that by far grew the most by 46%, that is. While we have other sectors, the more, let's say, established by now, um, there are desktop and mobile that grew by 20 and 25% uh, respectively. While we have backend and web, they grew just above average. So this is what the sectors look like. And as I said, there's no such thing as you know, um, a desktop only developer where there is, but it's not so common. So we need to be careful about that. Okay, so such a big boom um, implies that something happened in the background. So one of the key drivers uh, behind the boom was the rise of cloud, um, several cloud technologies. So we have been tracking consistently through our surveys um, the technologies that uh, backend developers use. And I'm showing you here the trend for the last two years. And as you can see, some of them grew really fast. So what happened here is that with the rise of all the as a service models, so database as a service, platform as a services, and, and so on, um, we have the cost being lowered. So even startups can start a business um, without having to set up a server or anything. And therefore, the barrier to entry immediately dropped um, as the cost dropped. Um, and then we have containers, who were in fact uh, the ones that grew the most. So you can see 23% points in two years. Um, and also uh, container orchestration tools, um, but then also DBAS and, and sorry, private and serverless architectures. So um, uh, backend teams didn't have, you know, the hassle of, dealing with all the all the servers it's you know um serverless does that for you so um therefore cloud oh not to mention also um the processing power that people get through cloud that they wouldn't get otherwise uh, locally so dealing with big data working crunching um large amounts of data became easier and less expensive so that was one reason uh, behind um, the boom the other of course uh, was the emergence, the, the boom of APIs. So here I'm going to show you just the case of ML APIs. We asked ML developers and data scientists to take in our survey how they're involved in machine learning and data science. Um, and then you get to see, of course, that many of them are learners. But that aside, uh, what I want you to focus on is that third bar there. Um, so it's the third most popular answer that they consume third-party APIs, such as vision, speech, or recommendation APIs. And that's how they're involved in machine learning. So one in four got involved through using an API. And that uh, obviously is part of the huge increase that we see in the ML uh, sector. And what do they do? So here, um, we also ask them, why do you use ML? Uh, what, what do you do with it? Um, and here I'm comparing those who consume third-party APIs to those, to everyone else really, um, in the field. And um, what I'm highlighting is that those who consume third-party APIs are most likely to be either building new ML products or adding ML functionality to their existing apps. So they're extending their applications or otherwise, because they're doing, they can do something a lot smarter, they feel that this way they can increase their chances of securing profitable projects um, or otherwise contribute to the research around AI ML, not in general scientific research, that's lower actually compared to everyone else, and not to improve organizational process. So what this really means is that it's, it's really um, developers from other sectors pouring in the sector because, and that was facilitated, um, by the existence of um, APIs. Um, so with that happening, um, something else also happened. Um, developers then started going, moving away slightly, but not too much, uh, from their natural habitat of software projects and services and into the so-called vertical industries. So this is the professional developers here and where other company is active, which industry. Of course, we track far more industries. I'm just showing you here a few examples. So for example, people pouring into health and medical, um, how that happened. I mean, 
yeah, taking advantage of cloud, but also um, ML and thing robotics, computer vision, diagnostic uh, algorithms, uh, predictive algorithms, and so on. Um, that led to to a boom there. Um, financial services is also very interesting because through uh, payments APIs, for example, financial institutions, you know, feel they can reach uh, more um, more people, a wider audience, um, and therefore uh, they're trying to attract more developers uh, to build a developer community and they employ more developers. Also, the rise of private cloud made financial institutions somewhat more confident uh, in terms of security. And so given the significant uh, cost reductions, they went into that. Also for data analytics and business intelligence, all those APIs are on visualization. Um, the cloud, of course, um, processing power, um, all the um, uh, databases as a service. Uh, all the uh, machine learning as a service and all of that uh, facilitated uh, all the extensions to reporting extensions to ERP and CRM systems that led to this developers going into those sectors. Now, all of those, so the ecosystem grows um, and it's not just, just people crunching code in the corner that you don't, don't need to worry about. What we find consistently over the last few years is that developers are in fact um, very actively involved in tooling decisions. So 71%, that's really close to three quarters of them, are involved in tooling decisions. Um, nearly half, so 45%, say they are at least influencers, so influencing decision makers. And um, at least 20, so more than 20%, there's some overlap here. Um, so I'm not going to add them up, um, are actually either making the final selection decision or uh, approving budgets. So you need to reach developers, uh, and by reaching developers, you're reaching the decision makers in seven out of ten uh, cases. So that's why you need to. Um, but what does it mean reaching developers? Are they just one concrete set of people that will just react to whatever you have to say in a similar manner? Well, no, as I said, this is a diverse set, and this is a quick way of showing you how diverse it is. So developers who are into different sectors are quite different. Um, so we find that it is the least experience that leap from into the emerging sectors. You'll see here, this is years of experience in software development, um, dark blue being those who have six plus years of experience in it. So you see that machine learning uh, developers are uh, not that experienced not as compared to backend services. Uh, games, of course, we know it's, it's um, um, the realm of hobbies in many cases who are just trying their hand in something fun. Um, but the point is that it's the, it's the least experienced and uh, we've seen it um, in, uh, in other cases as well in the past. Um, similarly, it is the younger uh, who uh, jump into the emerging sectors. So you see that 42%, the greens are the younger age groups here, 42% um, of ML uh, AI developers are uh, in fact under the age of 25, and that's 37% for VR and 35 for AR. So all the emerging sectors have a younger population than um, these sectors that are more established, like backend and web and so on. So that implies that um, there are huge training opportunities here for vendors. So you need to know your audience. If you're, you're talking to a VR um, developers, you're very likely an ML developers, you're very likely talking to younger people, to learners. So supporting them in the learning, for example, is a very good idea. So that's why you need to know what's the profile of your specific audience. Um, another thing, now that we're in the age topic, uh, another thing in which uh, the young people um, are a little bit different um, is their attitude towards open source. So we ask developers whether they contribute to open source, not whether they use it. We have asked before, we know most of developers use open source. The question is, do they contribute? And as you can see here on the left, the younger they are, the more likely they are to be contributing, um, as opposed to the older uh, 
um, developers. And why do they contribute? If you look at the, on the right, uh, the younger they are, the more likely they are to contribute because they want to learn, they want to improve their coding skills, also because it's fun. Um, sadly, we miss our sense of fun as we grow older. Um, shame. Um, and also, it makes them feel part of, they belong somewhere. So the sense of community is really strong uh, with open source. So supporting a community here and supporting them in a way that they learn is really important. And by the way, whether they contribute or not, uh, even from non-contributors, we have data that shows that um, they, they are looking for support in open source from vendors. So just something to keep in mind. So this gives you an idea of how the next generation that is coming in and what happened as the, the barriers to entry were uh, lowered. So how, it is a diverse ecosystem and how do, you, um, how do you reach out to it? So we think segmentation is the answer, So, but before we show you how, um, we asked, uh, we survey not just developers, but also the leaders um, in the developer relations space and dev marketing as well. So they ask them if and how they, they segment their audiences. Sadly, one in four uh, don't. Um, and those out of those who do, um, several tend to use the wrong dimensions. They, don't, they go about it in the wrong way. Uh, what's the wrong way? It's using technology. So if you try to use programming languages or type of development, desktop web, and so on, um, as I demonstrated um, about type of development, you won't get clear cut groups, you won't get segments because simply because developers will use um, more than one languages, more than one types of development. So it's not pointless just labeling someone as Java developer, he will be using something else uh, on the side. Um, so to give you an, another clue, if you need one, of why segmenting on technology is a bad idea, um, well, the other, problem with technologies is that they have the bad habit of dying on you. So this is a picture from ancient history, 2012. Uh, we have been gathering data since then, before that actually. And that's Blackberry and Symbian. And look what happened to them. And not eight years later, it's just two years later. So um, 2012 to 2014, uh, Blackberry lost um, most of its uh, usage, most of its user base. Right. So if you had created segments back then, mobile developer segments based on platform used, well, so you would find that some segments were quite empty um, and other platforms uh, have um, uh, risen in, in the meantime, and then you wouldn't have taken account of those. So segmenting on technology is a bad idea. I'm happy to provide more details to anyone who's interesting. So what do we do? So here's a solution instead of more problems. Um, what we do is that we let the, our data speak unsupervised. Unsupervised means no assumptions, no prior assumptions made. You need to make an assumption and theoretically define your population, so your, your whole targeted audience, um, which may not be as trivial as you may think. But once you have done that, just let the data guide you um, without taking technology into consideration. Just use demographics, firmographics, you know, roles, companies, and so on. Um, so we did that as an exercise. So what I'm showing you here is six personas that we came up with. We're not saying that this is the one uh, segmentation model everyone should be using. Um, it's just an example of how to segment. Uh, so without making any assumptions whatsoever, we ended up with six uh, segments that actually follow the evolution path um, of developers, starting from young learners here who are young and they are uh, learners and they're not professionals that is and they're not buying anything they're broke and moving on to young professionals they're juniors someplace they're just programmers they don't have any say the middle standards are a bit more specialized architects and so on they have some say uh, all the way to seasoned decision makers who really uh, call the shots um, and they're older of course and in parallel to these uh, we have the emerging extenders who are really uh, mostly in small companies or startups and having a background um, in the more mature sectors. They're extending to AR, VR, IoT and machine learning to um, build a better business. And otherwise we have those inexperienced loaners on the side where somewhere quietly in the corner, they're doing something. They're, they're main designers, among them also. Um, and they're not working in any teams, not making any money, it's just for them. So this is just an example of how to build. Now, 
suppose you have built a model. How do you know it works? So you know that because uh, your segments behave differently and you want them to behave differently so that you can approach them with a different message, a targeted message just for them. So here's just an example of those six personas and their attitudes towards um, emerging technology. We just picked two, we track a lot of them. Here's DevOps and robotics. So you can see, for example, that middle standards and decision, decision, uh, decision makers um, are far more into DevOps than anyone else, while extenders, for example, are far more into robotics. So that's how we know a segmentation works. Okay, so putting everything together, what I've said here, if you are to remember six things out of what I had said, one, the developer community has seen an amazing growth and we expect uh, the number of developers to be more than above 22 million by the end of the year. Two, it was the boom in APIs and cloud technologies uh, and then also the rise of open source communities behind this boom, behind the, the growth. Third, as the barriers to entry were lowered because of this boom in APIs and cloud, the typical profile of the developer is diluted. Just about anyone can develop something. Um, and there's therefore no such thing as a typical developer. So um, on the other hand, you also have developers taking decisions. They're influencers, 71% of them are. So diverse on one hand, they are the decision makers on the other. You have to do something about it. Um, and segmenting your audience is key to maximize their return on your developer outreach investments. And you know you've done a good job of defining personas um, when each persona is behaving consistently, so systematically roughly the same, predictable way, um, and differently from the other personas. So that's it. Um, if you would like to um, play around with our population data and estimate the size of your developer population, your target audience, uh, just Copy this link. If you don't have the time to copy it now, just pass by our booth. We'll give you access. Um, and then you can play around. No subscription required and figure out how many developers there are in regions and using specific languages and so on. And that's all for me. Any questions? Hi, Christina. In the last minute, we have for one question that we have from Rahul uh, Diger from PayPal. Um, even if you wouldn't segment based on technology, uh, how important is to understand what technology the developers are familiar with to answer questions like, should we launch a REST or GraphQL API? It is important to understand it, but what it is important to understand is how they decide to use technology X versus Y. And what we have found over and over again is that, you know, just by tracking the usage, okay, so they, they migrate to another tool why you, you cannot predict that uh, well enough well if if you look into the motivation so we have found that the motivation is the very reason why they went to development to begin with is a very good predictor of choices so you have to build a model that will help you predict those choices and that model is segmentation you know, based on motivations and everything yeah that answer I yeah. yeah, thank you very much, Christina, very much for being there with us. Uh, so you. yeah, if you want to know more about the market research for developers, you can go on the booth and slash data or reach, reach Christina directly.